So the fifth lesson, as we sort of look again at why America industrialized, look has to deal with trade policies, uh, the role of government, and the con some concept of laissez-faire, of course, that we'll, we'll look at first. Now, what is laissez-faire? Now, this is a concept, it's a French word, it means hands-off. Effectively, the laissez-faire economics, as it's come to be known, or the term implies, explains the U.S. government's approach to managing the economy, which was, we're not going to do very much. Limited government intervention, i.e., the government effectively lets the private sector, individual enterprises and companies, um, and, of course, the profit motive, which means that industry, if they can make a profit, will rise up to meet the demand to get that profit. That's known as the profit motive. And they rely on that to ensure the supplies of goods and services to the American customer. Essentially, effectively, the government's going to say, you need to provide this. They won't do that at all. They'll basically say, allow people to try and figure out a way to make money and serve that, serve that niche. The whole concept of laissez-faire really develops from Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, an incredibly important book written in about 1774, 1775, which is the foundation of the modern capitalist system. And it becomes conventional wisdom and public policy in the United States that laissez-faire should be the way in which the government handles the economy, i.e., leave it to the market. And this is pretty much dominates the, the, the period that we're talking about in both Unit 6 on the Gilded Age and, uh, and also into the Great Depression, changing dramatically actually when the New Deal comes along. Um, governments, it's said, and Adam Smith argues, of course, that the la they lack the knowledge and expertise to run the economy. Um, therefore, big business should. One important point though, it's not that the government of the United States was out of the economy altogether. The government, for the most part, did stay out of business, um, also perhaps because the government becomes dominated by business interests. In fact, the majority of the congressmen um, at this particular time are, uh, are, are businessmen. Benjamin Harrison, who we'll talk about, ben, not Benjamin Harrison, um, Johnson, who I will talk about a little bit later in the lesson, becomes president of the United States in, in 1888. And he leads what's known as the first billion dollar Congress, which is the total wealth of all of the businessmen in his Congress. And um, anyways, make a long story short, the acceptance of laissez-faire is directly linked to the American dream and the notion of individualism. Laissez-faire was the way because in reality, there could really be no other way in this country. This is a country of, you will get it if you work hard. It is up to the individual. The government will not help you. And this is inherent in the myth of the West, and this is inherent in the American dream. And it underlies why Americans are so rigidly attached to the concept of laissez-faire. So, um, there are, as Mr. Ray explained, there are exceptions. Now, sometimes they pretended that they weren't exceptions. In fact, a lot, most of the time they uh, pretended they weren't exceptions. And they, e even then, they tried to keep an arm's length. So, for example, the railroads. The government was instrumental in making the railroads happen. They passed a number of acts um, sort of allowing companies to construct the railroads and they're giving free land, etc. But it's important to realize with the railroads, they don't do them themselves. It's always enabling companies to do them. So they might give them land, they might say you can do it, but there's never a public government thing that makes the railroad per se. It's very important you don't get confused when explaining it. But essentially, without the land, without the permission, without the money they give, as a subsidy, I will give you a bonus if you do it and you do it in a certain way, um, to the private companies, there's no way you'd nearly get as much in the way of railroads, and there's no way you'd nearly get in the way of um, the economic effects of the railroads as a result. Uh, same thing with international trade. We've already mentioned tariffs, we're going to go to tariffs much more in, in a second. Um, the government sort of didn't see this as a, 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 a sort of undermining laissez-faire. They saw this as almost like proper, you know, this is what they do at worst, they do at worst. They tried, basically tried to hide the fact that it wasn't laissez-faire. True laissez-faire is just allowing any old stuff to come into the borders and seeing how it does. They basically hid the fact that they weren't doing it. But essentially, it is really helpful to trade um, uh, for the Americans that their products, as we shall see, um, are not having to compete with ones made by uh, French or British companies which will last longer. And finally, the, currently the, finally, apologies, the currency policy is just as important because obviously the Democrats um, cede during the Civil War and because they are pretty much powerless for the first decade or so afterwards, um, the Republican Northeast focused bankers and industrialists get their way in Congress. And so there's a lot more changes to the laws on 
currency, for example, the allowing the printing of greenbacks, um, which makes more money in the economy, therefore more consumers, as well as that making more availability of the uh, money bit of which can be trained change from American money to foreign money, which again helps export stuff. And as well as that, the fact that people like J.P. Morgan um, uh, were influential in government circles meant that the government did change the economy to suit bankers and therefore encourage bankers to do more banking. But apart from this, pretty much anything goes. Um, yeah. Laissez-faire was sort of the the way uh, it was. And of course, when you have the private sector basically dominating the economy and people essentially pushing the government around with very little intervention, you not naturally, but in this case, most certainly get corruption. The captains of industry, guys like Morgan, Rockefeller, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, found it to be good business to buy off state and federal legislatures, i.e. buy all the politicians off. So whatever government bill is passed is essentially favorable for big business. Vanderbilt's one of the biggest ones. He bribes congressmen to get land grants for future railroad construction all over the Midwest and into the West. Um, it was said of Rockefeller and his company, Standard Oil, that he could do anything with the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania legislature except to refine it. Ah! Ah! Oh, that kills anyways. Um, yeah, anyways, congressmen became pretty accustomed to bribery. In fact, it actually becomes a way of working. The uh, In Congress, for instance, the concept of the strike, if you will, um, becomes sort of becomes the way forward. The strike um, or that system um, is that the congressman is the system um, that um, essentially says, well, they want they get the congressman get money um, from the private businesses to kill bills. What that means is there is a law going through the Congress which will harm the oil industry. Basically, say they have to pay more taxes, or they have to follow rules, or harm the railroad, or whoever happens to be something that they don't like. Now, the congressman know that the people in charge of the business that's targeted from the higher taxes, the increased regulation, that's sort of rules and stuff, um, don't want that, and they will bribe the congressman. In order um, to not vote for it, so it doesn't happen. So what they used to do is propose the bill that was bad against steel, not because they wanted to like actually tax more, regulate more, but because they knew then they would get bribes to stop, to kill it, to not vote for it. So this this system was called strike. Obviously, it's not only corrupt; it's being corrupt in your corruption, which is particularly impressive. All of this basically added together that. No one really on the state level or on the federal level in Congress really wanted to get involved with government. And those who did very quickly had bribe money given to them to stop. And if it really didn't stop, money being poured into the opposition next election so that the opposition would win. And therefore, the opposition would probably do what they're told. Um, and therefore, the image and morals of politicians really became a joke in this period. The common saying being, an honest man is defined as one who, when is bought, it means bribed stay sports and that really sort of covers this period actually a really interesting period in history but if only if you like human weakness and fallibility so what are as mentioned the benefits of industrialized um, of tariffs to industrialization so we want to talk about tariffs increase and the reasons for it now there are a couple of reasons tariffs obviously are a tax so if you are French you bring your car in then yes you can say your car in Britain or sorry carry your car in America but you have to pay 40 to 50 percent tax on that so it's hundred dollars you have to pay forty dollars in tax and that'll mean that the government gets forty dollars basically for free and your car is now hundred it costs 140 dollars which no one's going to buy because that's crazy expensive likewise with all that money they don't need to tax businesses if you get enough money from tariffs you don't have to tax people or businesses which means that businesses and people benefit. Businesses, if their taxes are lower because the government gets its money from tariffs, um, then they do not have to charge as much per item because they're paying less in tax. People, they are taxed less, they have more money to spend and buy stuff from businesses. So getting income from federal government through tariffs meant that taxation was low, which meant that demand was high and production was high, which is good. As well as this from the 1860s onwards, the um, tariffs protect US industries, as mentioned, meaning that foreign made stuff is really expensive and no one wants to buy it. It's outcompeted. This is brilliant if you are um, starting a factory or if you have a factory, particularly if factory is new, because it basically means you don't have to worry about more established um, industries in other countries competing you and therefore you can sell quite easily. Um, this, this continues throughout this whole period because the Republican Party stay in power for most of this period. And partly because of the money that tariffs bring um, through bribery, because most of the rich people like tariffs. As well, 
Um, yeah, um, not, not, not much else to say uh, to that. Other awesome. than, yeah, other than the fact that yeah, I do mention at the bottom of this slide the McKinley tariff of 1890. It's just an example of the absurdly high tariffs that the Americans place on anything imported into the country. Now, you don't necessarily have to go about end your essay and start railing off uh, things you know about the McKinley tariff. But what you do have to understand is that tariffs are absurdly high. So, so what about the negatives, Mr. Ray? Okay, so the negatives of tariffs. Tariffs um, generally help manufacturers, but it's really important to know that they hurt agriculture. Um, agriculture wants to import machinery at lower prices. American machinery is inflated in its overall price. And if they're tariffs, American industry can charge essentially whatever it wants for the things that it produces. And some of the examples of, uh, of of expensive items at this point were anything having to help farmers, farmers needing threshers or tractors or whatever it is to make their farming more efficient and profitable, were charged um, very, very high prices for American-made uh, agricultural machinery. And as a result, the tariffs in which they could have, let's say, imported British tractors, which were produced much cheaper at the time, um, prevented that from being, uh, prevented competition, which meant that they never paid really the market price for the things that they needed. And all of this, of course, reflects the dominance in Congress of the industrial business interests. I talked about the billion dollar Congress, for instance. Um, that billion dollar Congress was made up mostly of industrial magnets in the Northeast, uh, people who were in the sort of the hardcore manufacturing, not necessarily agriculture. And because it was dominated by these type of businessmen, Congress protected their interests. Okay. Um, Presidents and their candidates are highly responsible to the needs of industry, but much less so to the needs of agriculture. And then they're also very highly responsible to the needs of um, overseas trade. So in other words, to try and get American goods overseas. Agriculture, not so much. So the classic example of the tension between uh, rural and um, industrial America was the 1888 presidential election. So obviously the manufacturers love tariffs because that means there's less competition from abroad. I mean, they can sell their stuff more, they make more profits. As Mr. Rain, I would like to make say myself excellently uh, outlined, the farmers in the South and West hate it because they, the costs of their, far, their farming implements, their fertilizers is much greater because it's basically you have to buy it from American factories and so they can charge what they want because it's so crazy expensive to buy it from outside of the tariffs. So what we get is the South with Democrats who represent the roughly rural point of view are against tariffs and the North Republicans who are represent the industrial roughly like it. And then we have an election and populism won and tariffs remain. In fact, they rise them. Um, and Benjamin Harrison there, you can see him sporting an impressive beard, uh, won despite not getting the most votes, and there's a whole thing about the Electoral College you do not need to worry about. But in the same way, Trump technically won. Yeah, however, interesting backlash, because Harrison is the first U.S. president to not win two successive terms. He's the first one-term president of the United States. It's actually more common for the uh, president of the United States to win the next election to get two successive terms. Harrison is the first president of the United States almost 100 years after his founding. That does not. And then all of it has to do with the fact that farmers got mad. And we'll talk about that and the sort of the rural backlash and other lessons. So what's the role of government? Um, as you can see, government really has no tradition of regulating the economy in the United States. Um, of course, the tradition is freedom for the individual. And many, in fact, come to the USA for that freedom. So there isn't really a push for government like there would be in other countries in the world to get involved here, to try and sort of make things more fair or even the playing field, et cetera, et cetera. The government is expected to play sort of one economic role. And that role is to support business in all its forms. But as we've seen in this lesson, their support is relatively one-sided. Not all its forms. It really just helps manufacturing industries, primarily in the Northeast. Um, the Constitution, and one of the reasons the United States government plays no role, not only do they <coughs> believe in laissez-faire, the Constitution, which outlined the rules of government, give government virtually no role in managing the economy. Presidents in Congress have shown no great desire to get involved either, for that matter at all. So... What else does that have an effect? Well, the government, therefore, because it doesn't look like it has to get involved and protect, quote unquote, people, because that would be meddling in the economy, um, had very little, very light rules and regulations on what you could and could not do. So, that, for example, you could, as a private business, tell your workers to work as long as you want them to. The logic was if workers don't want to work there, they won't. Okay? So, in reality, there's no laws restricting how long employers could demand their employees could work. Likewise, you were 
seen as earning the profits that you made, so therefore the government didn't tax those profits. Now, that's not necessarily bad for encouraging people to start businesses and they create demand, but that's part of the thing, and therefore means you have to have a small government with not much help because you can't afford it if you don't tax much. As well as that, there was no rules or regulations, at least in the early years, of how you can make business, what you can and cannot do. Seen that almost like the Wild West, it was up to you to chart your course, and if you get stung by it or you get you know, hit by it, that is your fault, and that's a risk you take um, as a businessman or as an employer, employee. Well, you're going to suck it up, start your own business if you don't like it. Um, the government, therefore, as always mentioned, were staffed by businessmen, but more often not corruptly controlled by businessmen, and therefore these um, uh, sort of parties and these sort of congressmen saw no real reason to get involved. Um, in most sort of changing the role of a business because that would not be great if they want bribes. Um, and as already mentioned, on the local state level, so the particular state, Pennsylvania, Ohio, etc., etc., where money probably matters probably even more because it's easier um, for local businesses to sort of know their local congressman and start bribing him, or lo sorry, local representative and start bribing, uh, bribing him, etc., etc., made sure that the local politics was, was controlled by the big important individual at the time. So Pennsylvania. In the case of controlled Rockefeller. by Rockefeller, uh, New York controlled by Vanderbilt. Absolutely right. So we will talk a lot more about the Sherman Antitrust Act in a future lesson. But it's just a one really good example of the United States government trying to do something about sort of the runaway capitalism, the let's be honest, massive corruption and shady ways that people were were ruining the opportunity for other people to come and get in on the market to sort of amalgamating all of their business. And we'll talk about trusts and the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, Act in great detail in later lessons, mm -hmm. but it is a good example. Now, the role of government, uh, as a, well, there are one more real aspect here, and this is the government getting involved in a weird sort of way. Now, we had mentioned the government gets involved in currency regulation, in tariff reform, as a couple of examples. The government also gets involved in backing big business against trade unions. The USA has no real tradition of trade unions that, say, like Britain had or a lot of countries in Europe had during the later part of the 19th century. Unions are organizations of workers that would bind together to uh, sort of speak with one solid voice. The idea is that if thousands of workers band together and all agree to hold the line and do the same thing, they have more power over their employer for getting better wages, better working conditions than if, let's just say, they... Um, uh, bargained as an individual. So unions start to pop up all over the world. Unions, by extension, pop up in America. In fact, a lot of immigrants bring these sort of very left-wing unionist socialist ideas over with them, and it spreads like wildfire across the America. And by the sort of the 1870s and 1880s, unions are popping up all over the place. So, so, but they're not that successful. The unions that do exist are pretty divided. You have some people saying, you know, we will protect the interests of skilled workers. Other groups saying, well, we want to protect the interests of unskilled workers, and they're not really working together. <coughs> Some become positively revolutionary, too, and unions start to disagree amongst themselves about the, about the best way to change. Others believe that, you know, we do it through peaceful means. We'll strike and we'll negotiate. Others say, well, they'll never listen to us, these captains of industry. The government's in their pocket. It doesn't really matter what we do. Let's rise up and have a violent revolt. And you get all sorts of different uh, sort of clashes between the unions, which overall weakens their effectiveness. But in some classic examples, the unions actually band together. In 1885, something known as the American Federation of Labor pops up, and that's sometimes known as the AFL. It's an important organization. And this is an umbrella organization for all labor across the United States. And their main weapon was to get people who feel that they're not making enough money, feel that their working conditions are poor, that they're working too long hours, to go on strike, i.e. withhold their labor from the company until the company decides that we need to pay for that labor. So when industrial disputes or strikes arise, the federal government usually is faced with a massive problem, okay? And it almost always in these cases, throughout the Gilded Age, sides with manufacturers. And very importantly, you see the government often using soldiers to assist owners in defeating workers' demands for better paying conditions. The government sides with industry, it does not side with the people. So very little is there to stop, let's say, an unscrupulous owner from managing his workforce in effectively any way he wants. And I'm going to walk you through two of the biggest case studies of, of labor issues, and you'll see 
um, a really good pattern emerging about how the government really doesn't side with labor. The first one is Carnegie's Homestead plant strike. The Homestead plant is the biggest steel mill in the world. I talked to you about how this is the place that really took the Bessemer steel making process to the next level. This plant alone made more steel than all of Britain by the time of the 1900 rolled around. Thousands and thousands and thousands of employees in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's Carnegie's largest plant. Now, when these guys go back on strike to get higher pay and also reduce the hours they were working, because they were working something like the average shift was like 14 hours long or something ridiculous amount like that. Um, Carnegie brought in 300 private guards, known as the Pinkertons. The, basically, there's a very famous private security firm known as the Pinkertons, which originate um, sort of in the West, actually, protecting stagecoaches and things like that before the advent of the railroads, but become a real uh, force in private security, almost like a quasi-military force by the time the Homestead plant strike um, but it comes around in, in the 1890s. Now, the Pinkertons come in uh, to break the strike bakers. In the fights that break out, seven of these people are killed, 26 other people are shot. Um, and after five months of standing outside the homestead plant, Carnegie's using strike breakers, people who, who would go in and try to make his steel um, and, and ignore the strike. And there's lots of conflict around. But anyways, after five months, the workers at the homestead plant go back to work. They give up their demands because... Um, they were starving, quite simply. If they didn't work, they were going to die. And Carnegie didn't really care. He was happy to keep using um, strike-breaking labor known as scabs. He was happy to, to use the Pinkertons to beat up or kill or intimidate anybody who tried to block his business. In fact, the picture on the right really, you know, for those of you who are willing to say, oh, well, he's such a philanthropist. He published a newspaper in seven different languages each representing the majority language of a lot of the workers. Of course, this is immigrant labor. A lot of these people speak English poorly. They certainly don't read English. So he publishes it in seven different European languages so that the people can read how bad their strike failed. And this was just rubbing salt in the wound to show you that I'm in charge. I will do whatever the heck I want. And the defeat of the Homestead Plant actually sets steelworking unions back decades. There's really, they're not going to see a successful strike in the steel industry until until the 20th century. It's, it's quite a while. Now, Carnegie's Homestead Plant strike is a big deal. The next one is the Pullman Car Strike of 1894. You may have seen a Pullman car. Um, Perhaps if you've been down to Victoria Station, you know that there's a, a fancy steam pull Pullman car uh, train. You can buy tickets. You can travel down to Brighton eating, eating a fancy five-car dinner. Maybe some of you have had the great pleasure of doing that. I certainly haven't, but anyways, it always looks nice. And the Pullman car are the really, really fancy turn-of-the-century rail cars with waiters in, in, in black suits and white linens um, serving the finest food and the finest wine while you travel in luxury through the countryside. The Pullman car. It's um, probably the most famous type of, uh, of carriage ever made. And George Pullman, the owner of the Pullman car factory, had cut wages in 1894. And he cut wages because he thought, well, I can, and I want to make a little bit more money, effectively. And as a result, his employees go on strike. Um, in fact, not only does he cut wages, but he refuses to reduce the rents he charged to workers in his company town. He actually made a town and he called it Pullman. And in that town, he built all the homes and charged the workers rent so that these people worked. And at the end of the day, most of the money went back to Pullman himself. Now, he lowers their wages, keeps the rents very high, and make a long story short, people lose the plot and go and strike. Now, there is something known as the American Railway Union. It, does, it, it represents workers across the nation, not only in, um, in the Pullman factory. Now, there are a million railway workers, and a lot of these join this union called the American Railway Union, led by a man named Eugene Debs. Debs is a real firebrand labor guy. And basically, he says to everybody working the railroads, we refuse to handle or work, um, i.e. couple or do whatever it, it takes, refuel any train that has a Pullman car on it. And that includes the mail, because the mail travels on, on, on trains at this time to get from point to point. So Pullman goes to President Grover Cleveland, who's the president after Harrison um, in, from 1892 until the turn of the century. And he goes to President Grover Cleveland. And he says, I need your help. We need to keep the mail trains running. I want you to help break the strike. So what, what he does is he sends the army. Their scuffles break out. Several of Pullman's guys are killed by U.S. soldiers on behalf of the government led by Grover Cleveland. And Debs himself 
who refuses to give up his union's action, the one that they won't help him pull cards, finds himself arrested and he's incarcerated for the rest of his natural life for not listening to the government and backing down and getting <laughs> basically oppressed by his employer. So the key message of this um, lesson about the role of laissez-faire is, and I think the thing really thing to point out to the ANA star is, yes, laissez-faire is very helpful. It helps sort of encourage competition. It helps stimulate demand. It helps help develop. But it is inconsistent. I would, and I think the real top answers make a point that it's a very selective laissez-faire and it's a very pro-business laissez-faire, considering the massive corruption that is inherent within the American system, American political system at this time. So while laissez-faire is helpful, always make a point that actually the points at which they're not laissez-faire help, they're not doing laissez-faire, are just as helpful. That's all I have to say. Good point, Mr. Tudor. Guys, that's it for this lesson, and we're uh, going to advance quickly to the next lesson, which uh, are the final reasons in which uh, Americans industrialize, uh, industry wins.